I think by Muslims not engaging in politics right now, we, we uh, facilitate our own oppression. Assalamu alaikum. Got a question through Facebook and the link for my Facebook page is in the description box. For those of you who would like to send questions, uh, suggest topics or things that you have on your mind that you would like to hear some comments about in these scattered thoughts. Um, and this question comes from Matt. And Matt is asking, um, can Muslims ever engage in politics, meaning secular politics, given, our, uh, given that our devotion is ultimately to Allah, His books and His messengers, to what extent can we become active in political ideas, which are essentially based upon man-made laws, man-made philosophies, and the elite's ideas of what society should look like? If we are to strive to make the world a better place, how can we reconcile our devotion to the deen with the reality of how politics influences our everyday lives? I'm confused concerning this issue. Um, well, Matt, a lot of people are confused concerning this issue. It's, um, in, on the one hand, I, I shouldn't really do a scattered thought on this because it's a very long topic that we can have lectures upon lectures on. But on the other hand, I want to give you a quick answer um, that maybe can um, help you a little bit clarify it. I'll give you an example. Ali ibn Abi Talib anhu who the Prophet Sallallahu said about him, أَنَا مَدِينَةُ الْعِلْمِ وَعَلِيٌ بَابُهَا أو كَمَا قَالْ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وسلم. The Prophet said that he is the city of knowledge and Ali, رضي الله عنه, his cousin, is the gate to that city of knowledge. So when it comes to understanding the tradition, I mean, we always talk about the Salaf, we talk about the pious predecessors, we talk about the Tabi'een, we talk about them. Their understanding of the religion surpasses and their take on it surpasses all others. Fair enough. If you actually look at how they interacted with the tradition and really examined it closely, if someone were to come today and try to do the same thing that they were doing, they would be called a heretic very quickly by some circles. Uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib was, uh, had to fight a group of Muslims that defected. We now know them as the Kharijites. And this group of Muslims, one of their reasons for fighting Ali ibn Abi Talib anhu, which is just really a justification. I mean. Religion is always utilized in a way, or often is used, utilized in a way to assert power and subjugate others. Um, and what these guys wanted to do, they said, look, Ali ibn Abi Talib, he's coming up with laws from his own mind. He's not adhering to, in hukmu illa lillah, there is a verse in, in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that uh, ruling is verily to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Ali ibn Abi Talib is coming up with laws and things that are not from the Quran. And he sent Ibn Abbas who had a debate and he had a few thousand come back with him. Anyways, long story short, bottom line is this has already happened in the history of, of Muslims. And Ali ibn Abi Talib was accused of doing something like that. When in fact, there are actually evidence in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relegates and he says, let some of those, uh, uh, you know, of your group, of your peers, those people of knowledge, those people who have some authority, you know, he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you get to sometimes deliberate and come up with something that works for everybody. If you look at the history of Islam and Muslims um, and uh, the land that they ruled over, they had non-Muslims uh, around them. And so the way that they governed was within, with keeping in mind the fact that not everybody that you're ruling over is a Muslim. So you can't expect non-Muslims to adhere to your laws. And that's why we have in the tradition situations where you have Christian communities who consume alcohol. They were allowed to buy and sell alcohol amongst each other and consume it. Uh, you have situations in which even the Zoroastrians who had sibling marriages, incest, was also permitted under Islamic rule. Um, and so these things, you hear, you hear about them and you think, what's going on here? This is totally against the Sharia. Well, for you as a Muslim, it's against the Sharia. But there's a difference between what you adhere to as a Muslim in your own kind of community and in your private affairs. And when you're talking about a community that lives, a diverse community with multiple faiths and multiple religions and multiple... Some people don't even have a religion. Atheists, they don't recognize any of this stuff. So you, this is where this discussion, you find it. There's this uh, debates and discussions between the scholars of how to go about this if this was a totally Muslim governance rule that you in one way adhere to the Sharia ah, and at the, at the same time you don't oppress people and impose, you know, impose your religion upon other people. So 
this is already present. Anybody that tries to simplify the subject for you and try to tell you that uh, we must rule by the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do this, this and that and, and, and force the non-believers into uh, you know, our... This is a simpleton-minded person who doesn't understand what they've read. They've read some things in books, but they don't get it. So I would say ignore all of that. Um, there is a lot of good works by contemporary Muslim scholars who ad adhere to the tradition who engage in politics. And so I think by Muslims not engaging in politics right now, we, we uh, facilitate our own oppression. I mean, look at, look at the history of uh, uh, Jews, for example. Why do Jews have a privileged position in society um, where they have uh, they've asserted themselves and kudos to them it's good because when they weren't it facilitated their own oppression but when they get in positions of power and they start lobbying and they start paying money and getting involved in politics and doing all of these things that's how you that's how you protect your community uh, same thing with the LGBTQ community. What happened? They're, what's happening right now? Observe what they're doing. They're lobbying, they're organizing, they're, they're getting together, they're putting differences between each other aside and coming together and saying, listen, we're a community in this greater country of ours and we need to make sure that the equal rights that are guaranteed under the rule of law and under the constitutions that we have and the Bill of Rights and all of these things, we need to make sure that they're not stripped away from us. Muslims need to do the same thing. We don't have enough Muslims involved in politics in a way that allows us to be engaged, to give back. I mean, there's a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ says, أَحَبُّ النَّاسِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَنْفَعُهُمْ لِلنَّاسِ The most beloved of all people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who brings most benefit to all people. And what greater way for you to do that other than public service? I mean, one of the reasons I think this issue of radicalization and, and marginalization of the Muslim community happens is because, you know, look at most parents. What do they want you to be? A doctor or an engineer? That's it. But you come to them and say, I want to do a political science degree. Um, very few of us, we don't have enough. We have many lawyers, but not enough for us to be able to get into public service and get into politics like that. Um, so I would say engage in the politics and... You should study, you should find yourself a, a traditional teacher who teaches you how, it's not enough for you to learn what is in the books of fiqh. That's not enough. You need to understand how these rules in the books of fiqh operate. How are they derived and how do they get applied and in what sense do they get applied? It's not enough for you to know what is in the text. You need to know the context and you need to know when these things come into play and how do they come into play and all of these things and the objectives of them generally speaking and at all times make sure you have a connection with people that are in the tradition that are trained in the tradition that are upholders of the principle scholars as far as i'm concerned should not be involved in politics at all muslim scholars need to be uh, elevated above it in the words of sheikh abdullah bin bayya scholars need to be the umbrella they should not be uh, uh, you know, pledging allegiance to any particular party. What they are is they stand outside of it and they're the umbrella that commands good and forbids evil. They're the reminders. They are Ahlul Dhikr that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to. They're the people of reminders. They give you the reminder. So you go back to them and refer to them in the sense that they're like your moral compass. But politics, once you get that into the moral, once you take your moral compass and put it into politics, which is really a pragmatic thing, you lose morality. So they have to stay outside of it. And you do make some difficult decisions in politics that may at times contradict certain things that you might hold sacred for you. But you're not dealing with just Muslims. You're dealing with people that don't adhere to your same religion. And you have to accept that. Um, it's difficult for people that think black and white, totally black and white, very difficult for them to get this. And so I, I'm inviting you to kind of put that aside. Politics is a lot of gray area. Um, some things you have to uphold principles in, but you really have to be careful. I would say study the tradition, be connected with people of the, of the, of the tradition, scholars of the tradition. Study politics, get involved, do it for the sake of public service, and do it for the sake of serving Muslims and showing that Muslims have something positive to contribute instead of the negative messages that you hear all the time about uh, wanting to uh, establish some theocracy, caliphate, some imagined thing that these guys have 
uh, determined in their mind, um, which is really an image that is concocted in their mind based on a limited reading of the tradition and a projection into the past that has nothing to do with the reality of what the past was like. It's just a construct in their mind. I hope that helps you out, Matt. I know it's, um, it may not answer all your questions, but it is a scattered thought, and I just wanted to give you something to kind of get going on. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum. I hope you guys have been enjoying this content. I've changed the background a little bit and all of this stuff, and I'm adding more stuff to the channel. Um, to show your support, the best thing you can do for me is to like the video and to share it with your friends and family and your social network and just you know tweet it and Facebook it and all of this good stuff. Those of you who are able to give some financial support in some kind to help me make some more videos, uh, I've got a few projects that I'd like to get into. You can go to my Patreon page, the link for it is in the description box or you can link right here. You can click right here for it and uh, you can help me out through that way. So anyways, I'll check you next time.